good morning and welcome to today's webinar on complete training of latest software uh, ocean view 2.0 with ocean insight spectrometer we are very much uh, excited as we have very experienced speaker from ocean optics uh, today uh, the second wave of covid 19 has, has affected all of us adversely and thus we as sensor are making a conscious effort in the in these difficult times to give you to impart training to all the researchers and and whoever are using the instrument to use it even better with uh, better efficiency and with all the uh, all the data that which can be collected and uh, yeah so let's do that and um, also uh, yeah you can leave your uh, questions regarding some of the topics if you have any doubts uh, in the comment section and we will address it uh, later in the end of the session i am shilpa ramesh from sensor international i'm working as sales and service engineer since four years in this company and i will be hosting today's session so a little about uh, sensor international sensor international is a pioneering uh, company in marketing and servicing of highly sophisticated overseas products for india the company is promoted by scientists and technocrats who are having more than 25 years of experience in implementation, sales, and support. Sensor International was started in the year 1995 to serve the scientific community. The operation started at Baroda, and within a short span of time, it started its branches all over India. We have uh, seven branches across India with 35 employees. We have branches in Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Bangalore, uh, Kolkata, and uh, in Telangana, etc. And we deal with a variety of products ranging from electrochemical workstations to spectrometers uh, to spectroelectrochemistry accessories and etc. So this was about Sensor International, a little about the webinar. Uh, in today's session, a uh, highly experienced speaker, Yvette Matley and Dr. Derek Gunter will demonstrate how to use the OceanView 2.0 software from basic to advanced level. And I'm very sure it would be helpful for each and everyone. So I will just uh, tag in the speaker. I'm tagging them in. We are, Derek and I are both time with, with you this week talking about Ocean View. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background on myself, I am a longtime Ocean employee. I've actually been with the company for 19 years. My favorite role at the company has been anytime I can uh, be an application scientist, helping our customers to determine whether the equipment's going to do what they need it to do, generating content, anything to get me in the lab, because at the heart of Yvette is for sure a lab rat. So Derek and I spend an, a lot of time using Ocean View, um, and so we are very excited about sharing that with you guys. My current role at the company, just to finish the introduction on me, is I am currently the manager for the lab services and America's tech support team. So I still get to continue all this great interaction that I love to have uh, with our customers and our users to enable them to do some really amazing things using spectroscopy. So enough about me. We're here today to talk about Ocean View, and all, after many years of, of doing measurements at the company, both Derek and I have developed a true love of the Ocean View software and the power that comes from it. So part one of the series today that I'm going to be doing is actually going to introduce you to new Ocean View 2.0. And if you have worked with Ocean View before and haven't seen 2.0, you are going to be amazed at the, the differences and the update that's happened. So what we're going to start with today is an introduction to the first part or to Ocean View 2.0 itself. Sorry, I'm still here, just uh, trying to advance my slide. There we go. So what we'll cover today in part one is what's new in Ocean View 2.0. And we're going to do a little bit of a, 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 we'll call it a whirlwind software tour through Ocean View. But we're going to talk about how to get started with the software, 
what do you do once the software starts up, especially if you haven't used any of the Ocean software before? We'll do a little bit of a tour in terms of giving you an overview and also let you know where to find some of your key functions that you would most people traditionally want to do when they're making their measurements. So I would be remiss for those who have not used OceanView before if I didn't tell you a little bit about what OceanView is. So um, who knows, maybe people are working from home and are looking for something fun to do and they saw a webinar and said, let's sign up. So if you've had no exposure to OceanView before, it is a flagship desktop spectroscopy application. And we launched this back uh, about seven years ago. And it gives you real-time control and processing of your measurements, and it's platform independent, so it works with Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And to give you a few more features, it's very easy to use. I know, easy for you to say because I've been using it so frequently, um, but we'll show you how to do what you need to do so you can get up and running easily. It gives you complete experiment control. So you can do processing of your data, you can do all kinds, as Derek will discuss tomorrow in more detail, all kinds of things that you can do in the schematic to actually do more than just see spectral data. We can actually get to answers using that schematic mode. The software is highly customizable, and I'll show you where you do that customization and also how you can save a project so that customization is very easily reinstated the next time you start the software. I mentioned answer-based output. That is something we're very excited about. Ocean has a lot of applied spectral knowledge. We want you to have that too. And what that means is you're not just looking at spectra. You're actually getting the answers that you want to get from that data. So we're very excited to share how you can do that with OceanView. And the interface, very friendly, easy to use interface, as I'll show you in the, in the coming slides. So what's new in OceanView 2.0? For those of you who are using, currently using OceanView, you probably have seen what we have up here in the right-hand side of the window where we're looking at OceanView 1.6.7. So that's the version that was out right before we launched 2.0. So you can see this kind of functionality. What we've done in 2.0, and I feel like music should play when I show the reveal for what the new software looks like, especially in comparison to what we had in 1.6.7. We have tremendously enhanced the, the, the GUI to make it more intuitive, to have a contrast-friendly dark mode, to create a very smooth user experience, and really to update the software in terms of the look, feel, and the, even the icons have been updated to have a much more modern look and feel to them. In addition, there's streamlined operation associated with 2.0. The software engineers, in addition to this tremendous job they did in giving us this beautiful user interface, they have also fixed bugs and tweaked some of the functionality and features to try and improve and give us faster, more stable operation. So very exciting changes in 2.0, and one of the reasons that Rachel, Derek, and I wanted to make sure that we were sharing that with you. All right, let's get started. Let's get to the fun stuff. How do we actually use this software? So once you navigate to the OceanView icon after you've installed your software, and just a little reminder for my tech support guys that you always want to install the software before you connect a spectrometer to your computer. So you navigate to this icon on your desktop, and you click on it to open up the software. So our beautiful software window is opened up, and now what do we do? So we're looking at this, and we've got lots of things and buttons we can push. What do we do first? When we designed OceanView, one of the things that was really important to us was to make it very easy for our users to be able to get to the major pathways or get to the major features that they would like to access very easily. So we included in the software this welcome screen, which you can see I've um, blown up here below. This has the three of the main pathways that people typically take to enter into our software. So the first one is the quick view mode. And for those longtime Ocean users, quick view is uh, what we used to call scope mode. And this is really a live shot of what the spectrometer is seeing. It is raw, unprocessed data, which hasn't been 
corrected for instrument response. So one thing to keep in mind, or maybe the best way to think of quick view is like a diagnostic mode. It'll help you set your acquisition parameters so you're not saturating and you can look at the impact of these things without being in the middle of a measurement. So quick view is there for you, but think of it more as a diagnostic mode as opposed to a measurement mode. We have an option to load a save project. So if you have gone through and customized and created these amazing Ocean View projects that will let you do all kinds of cool things, you can save those. We'll show you later on in the webinar. And then you can reload it directly from the welcome screen that starts up when you start the software. The other option, and this is where um, most people are probably going to go first, is into the spectroscopy application wizards. So this is a way to walk you step by step through what you need to do to get into a process mode like absorbance or um, re reflection or some of these other modes. So we'll, these are really, the goal of this welcome screen is really to help you very quickly do what you need to do in the software without having to hunt for buttons and icons and things to click. So this opens every time you start the software, unless of course you remove this show on startup button, but it's a nice easy way to, to get you into the software doing exactly what you want to do very quickly. So now let's say that I clicked on, let's go back up here, let's say I clicked on the quick view option, okay, And because I just want to get my spectrometer set up for my measurements. Now we've got, a, we've got all these windows and all these buttons and uh, to some this may look really exciting and to others it may be a little bit intimidating. So let's walk through what these various windows can be. This window that we have up right now is our main software win window and this is where you're going to find all of the controls and everything you're looking for. We have on the left hand side of the main window our acquisition control group or our acquisition controls. This is where we're going to set up the data acquisition how we want it and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Then we of course have our graph view so where the cool stuff goes on right this is where we can actually see our spectral data as it's being acquired and we have lots of controls there well which we'll talk about to enable you to customize that graph view. And last but definitely not least is the schematic view. And this is something that will be covered in a lot more detail tomorrow, but I'll touch on it in a little bit. This is a very powerful feature in Ocean View that enables you to customize the processing that's being done with your data. So very powerful feature that we'll talk about in a lot more detail. So back to the main, win main window. Uh, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit on some of these buttons that we see in the in the top of the main window. And I want it without going into tons of detail on all of these, I want to make sure that you know where to find these features when you're using the software yourself. So one that gets used frequently is uh, this button here, which is used to start up the wizards. It opens up a dialog box with all the different wizards for you to use. So let's say, for example, you've come in, you've done some stuff in Quick View, and now you want to start a wizard. Well, you don't want to have to restart the software to get to that welcome screen. So this is the button that you're going to use anytime you want to start a new wizard. We also have a new feature in Ocean View 2.0, which will let you switch between a basic mode and an advanced mode. So if I want to scale back the number of icons and the fe features and functionality in my software, I can click on this easy button and it will put me into a more basic mode where some of the functionality will be limited. It's very easy then to click that button and go back to the advanced mode as needed. But this is something that our users requested from us is a way to make the software easier to use and we've delivered with this great easy button and easy mode. Graph layer options is another icon or tool that you will probably use quite frequently and this is how we customize our view, which I'll tell you more about that. Then we have open a project and save a project. So these are going to be important. Once you've saved a project that has everything exactly how you want it to be, you'll then be able to come here and open that project back up. Um, it's another option to opening besides the welcome screen. 
The device manager is used if you want to add another spectrometer to something that's already running in Ocean View. So Ocean View is up and running. I decide I want to plug in my Ocean HDX. I can then go to the device manager to make sure that that, that device is now showing in the software. And last but not least, these are some global global tools that can be used for saving data from all of the spectrometers and all of the windows that are going on, or playing, pausing, and single stepping through acquisitions. So these, these buttons up here on this main window toolbar may get ignored, you may not even see them up there, but as you can see, there are some very important features and functions that you'll wanna be able to access, um, particularly looking at wizards and your graph layer options. The next window that I want to look at is your acquisition acquisition group window. So you'll typically see that on the left side of the main win window. Let me zoom up a little bit on that. And if your eyes are wide, that is definitely a lot of controls, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about them so you'll be more comfortable using them. This control panel is going to be different depending on what spectrometer you have attached. So one of the wonderful features of Ocean View is that we are able to see the controls that are just specific to our spectrometer. So instead of throwing up a bunch of controls, which may or may not apply, this is very specific to the spectrometer you have connected. So what we can see are several parameters that are gonna be important for setting up our, the acquisition uh, that we wanna do with our spectrometer. So if we zoom in a little bit, not that all of these controls aren't important, but these are the ones that you'll probably use the most often. So here we've got uh, the strobe lamp enable. So if you have a light source that is connected to your spectrometer, either directly connected through the external connector or via some type of cabling, you can control that light source, turn it on and off with strobe lamp enable. We then have integration time, which is the first acquisition parameter that you're gonna set. This essentially is how long we're collecting light. So if we increase the integration time, we're gonna see our intensity goes up. If we decrease the integration time, the intensity is gonna go down. So this is the parameter that you're gonna to adjust to impact the intensity that you're seeing. The software engineers being as wonderful as they are, they did include an automatic button. So you don't have to think too much about this. You'll actually be able to click this button and it will set the software to the integration time that's optimum with your setup. So very nice feature. So integration time, just think of that as impacting how long you're collecting light for. The next two acquisition parameters are very important and I think often ignored, uh, scans to average and boxcar width. Scans to average is exactly as the name implies. We're just collecting spectral data and averaging them together. In this case, I'm averaging 25 spectra together before I see anything displayed in my software window. This is a great, uh, it, it's important to use this parameter because this is gonna impact your signal to noise ratio. Um, in boxcar width, we're also going to have an impact on signal to noise ratio. In this case, it's a smoothing function. So think of it, uh, actually what's happening is for each pixel now, we're averaging whatever the value, here I have five set, whatever value I have set in that box, it's going to average that many pixels on either side of my pixel. So that may sound confusing, but essentially what that means is I am just smoothing my spectrum. So I'm essentially degrading my resolution depending on that value that I'm using. Boxcar width and scans to average are both, as I mentioned, important for improving your signal to noise ratio. So if I, um, the signal to noise ratio is gonna be improved by the square root of the scans to average, and then by the square root of the boxcar width. So these are very important parameters that you can set to improve your, your, the data that you're using. Now, like everything else in spectroscopy, there's a little bit of a trade-off with both of these. In the scans to average, you're going to be essentially increasing your measurement time. So if we have 200 millisecond integration time and we do 10 averages, we're suddenly going to be up to a 2,000 millisecond or two-second measurement time. So it does improve 
improve signal to noise ratio, but if you need fast measurements, it's going to slow your measurements down. In terms of boxcar width, uh, same type of trade-off in that we're smoothing our spectral data. So we get that improvement of SNR, but we also have some smoothing. And sorry about that, in spectroscopy there's always some sort of trade-off. Um, but I strongly recommend using these particular parameters to improve your measurements um, with every measurement you do. The other two controls are the electric dark, so if your spectrometer has uh, some dark pixels on it, we can use electric dark to essentially keep track of and monitor the electronic offset or the noise that's coming uh, from the electronics in the spectrometer. And then the nonlinearity correction is another uh, control that I recommend that you use. Our detectors are extremely linear, but this nonlinearity correction will make sure that we get the maximum linearity out of the out of the system. So there's other controls in this control panel. If you're into triggering, there's trigger mode you can select. If you don't want wavelength on your x-axis, you can change it here. But these are really the primary controls that you're going to use to set up your acquisition. So next up is the is the view window. So this is where our graph is displayed. And there are, you can see, there are a lot of controls on the top of this window. So let's let's take a little look at them so you can uncover the ones that are going to be most useful for what you're doing. So first off, we have a graph manipulation. So we're going to see, I'm just trying to zoom up so you can see these better. This is this part of the window. And so what we're looking at is different controls that let us change essentially the scale of the graph. So we can zoom out to maximum, we can fill the window with the graph, we can just scale the height to fill the window, we can manually set our ranges, and then these are kind of your zooming in and out and panning functions. So all of these controls in this first little, little section of our toolbar are designed essentially to manipulate the graph and, and how it's looking. I should mention that this is an expander, so I don't talk about it on, on every one of the slides because you're going to see these before each one of the menus we're going to talk about, and this can be used to collapse that menu. So another way besides using easy mode to kind of hide some of the controls is to use uh, this expander or collapser to make that menu go away. So the next set of toolbars I want to talk about in the view window are graph related. So this is where you can take a snapshot if you want. So, oh, I like that spectrum, let me save it. You click here on the camera and you'll save a snapshot in your view window. Of course, if we can save a snapshot, we want to be able to delete them. So you see that next in terms of the garbage can that we see there. Copy to clipboard is uh, a really useful feature that Derek and I use very frequently. This is a way to quickly take this data, I click this button, it'll copy this data to the clipboard, and then I can open up Excel and paste it in. So it's a very fast way if you want to do something or check something out to copy the data to the clipboard and then put it into Excel or some other program like that. Uh, this is to, uh, to uh, load a previously saved file, so if you want to compare to data you've already collected, you can use this particular icon. These are the icons we're going to use for saving spectra and configuring how we save spectra. We'll talk about those in more detail. And last but not least is our print button, which will let us print whatever we've set up in this graph view. Finally, we have what I'm calling the graph specialty features. So these are some other things that you can do to, um, to help do more with the data than just look at a graph, for example. So we have in quick view, you'll see these light bulbs, which will let you either create a relative reference spectrum. Um, so this is just a quick way to get rid of that instrument response function. You can also get rid of the dark or the background. So we used to work uh, previously in software, we called it scope minus dark or scope minus background. This is a great way that under dark conditions, you can quickly remove a background spectrum. We've got create a strip chart, which we'll talk about in more detail here. 
Uh, this is splicing spectral data, which is uh, an advanced feature that will let you take the data from two spectrometers and actually splice them together so you can see a complete spectrum in one window. So my favorite use case of this is when we're looking at uh, tissue reflectance using a flame vis spectrometer and a flame near spectrometer, I can now stitch these together or splice them together using this spectral splicing feature and see the whole range from 400 out to almost 1700 nanometers in a single spectrum. So very useful if you want to see a wider range than you can typically detect with a single spectrometer. If you'd like to see a table of the data, so I just want to see a table in, in my graph view or in my uh, software showing intensity versus wavelength, I can click this button and it'll produce a table for me. This is finding peaks. And this will be, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but of course, people often want to find the peaks in their spectral data, sometimes to look at the full width half maximum for that data or other things, other peak parameters. And last but not least in the view window is our, this is a, a, a really cool way to look at uh, the change in the spectrum over time. So this will put a temporary spectrum as your spectrum is moving. Let's say your intensity is going up. You'll see these light trails that will show what the spectrum, how the spectrum is actually moving. So big question, right? We just looked at all those views. Sorry, I jumped right ahead on you. But we just looked at all these different views and looks like there's a lot of stuff that we can do there. One big question is, can I actually customize my view? And by this, I mean my software as a whole. And absolutely, you can do that. And that's done using our graph layer options function. And so you can find this up in the main window on the top toolbar there. And this gives you a lot of capabilities in terms of what you can do to customize your window. So annotations, this lets you add text to a graph or whatever type of information you might want to put in there. We have the chart, which lets you set the fonts you use, the, whether they're bold, how big they are, all of that kind of information. I get a little obsessive compulsive over that one. And then visible spectrum, this is one where you can actually show the colors of the visible spectrum underneath your spectrum line. Trend line, this is where you can set the trend line colors. So what a powerful feature this is, no more colors popping up that you don't like seeing in your graph anymore. So this will let you actually set each and every one of these um, yourself, in addition to setting the width of your lines. Unit precision is to set the decimal places that you have on your X and Y axis. And it also lets you set kind of a default axis range uh, down here that you can access in the manually set numeric ranges section. And last but not least is the scalar view. This lets you uh, set the properties of how your scalar view, and by that I just mean a view that just shows a single value that's changing over time. So lots of things that you can customize using this graph layer options. And there's actually more than one way to access it. You can go to that top menu as shown above, or you can just right click in the graph view and pull up that menu. So a couple of ways to get to those controls, which are very important. The schematic window we're going to talk about in much more detail tomorrow. Uh, Derek has referred to it and to the capabilities of it as a hidden hero of ocean view and I couldn't agree more with him on that. It is very powerful in terms of letting you, oh sorry, let me show you how to get there first. So the schematic view is typically hidden behind the acquisition group window. So I wanted to put a box there so you could see it. Here's what it actually looks like. This might make a little more sense with the view up. So this is, this is uh, showing actually an absorbance process that was generated by the wizard. So I didn't put this together. The software actually did it for me. But now, as Derek will show you tomorrow, there's a lot I can do in terms of customizing. So without stealing too much of Derek's thunder, I'm going to say there'll be more on this and best practices for using using Ocean View Part 2 tomorrow, so you won't want to miss that presentation by Derek. Very powerful. To me, this is what sets our software apart from every other software. 
So we've talked about the windows and we've talked about getting into the software. So most people are going to start next looking at the wizards. So this gives you a list of the different wizards that are available. You can see we have quite a few wizards that will get you into a processed mode. So you're getting data that you can publish, that you can share with others that will make sense because it's putting it on the same process basis as others. So this is the preferred way for making measurements as opposed to, for example, using QuickView by itself. So as with the schematic, Derek is also going to be talking about these in more detail tomorrow. So tune in tomorrow to hear more about the wizards. But this is really probably the starting pathway most people are going to use to get into whatever mode they want to make their measurements in. So last but not least, I want to give you guys, let me see how we're we doing on time. Okay. I want to give you guys a few tips on how to do some common kind of traditional things you may want to do in the software and help you figure out where to find those things. So if you've saved a project uh, for absorbance, you have a darkened reference there. When you reload that project, you may want to update your darkened reference. We'll show you how to do that. You're certainly going to want to save data at some point. Creating a strip chart may be something you want to do to focus in on a specific wavelength or region. Finding peaks, many customers like to look at those peaks to try and get peak parameters for them. And we'll end with saving and reloading projects because after doing all this work to customize your software, you're going to want to be able to save that so you can get up and running immediately the next time you use the software. So first we'll talk about taking a new reference in dark spectrum. If we look, this is in the graph view, so we're looking at that big toolbar in the graph view again, and we're going to zoom all the way down to these light bulbs that we see here on the end. You can, when you reload a project or when you are in a processed mode, these light bulbs will appear in your graph view and you can use them to very quickly update your dark and reference spectrum at any time. So if your acquisition parameters change or if you're loading a project that has uh, old background and dark in it, you can very easily without having to rerun a wizard, go in and use these buttons, the reference and dark light bulbs to take a new value. So very straightforward and, and, and very quick in terms of being able to, to update your dark and reference, which is something we, we recommend that you do frequently to take into account drift and uh, ambient, changing ambient temperature can changes, changes and other things. Saving data. So saving data is typically a two-step process. The first thing that you're going to need to do is configure, which makes sense, configure your file saving options. So if, once we click on the configure button, this dialog box opens up. And on this side of the dialog box is where you're going to set things like the file format that you want to use, the name of the file, uh, where you want to save it. And so most people are going to be mostly on this side of the save box. Note that files are saved out of Ocean View as ASCII, so they work really nicely with um, Excel and other programs. And there are several different formats under there that you can select from, with a header, without a header, um, a time series, a whole, a whole range of different types of file saving options you can do. The save options over here on this side is for someone who wants to save, maybe save 10 spectra automatically and then stop saving spectra. Or maybe they want to save one spectrum every hour for 10 hours. This is where you can set some of those more advanced automated saving options. For someone just trying to save a single file, they don't care about automated, then save every scan stop after this many scans one is going to do what we're most used to as a traditional save so once you've set the options that you want the next step is to click apply this is very very important so it applies all those changes and remembers them then we click exit now we're ready to start saving our data now is when we go to oops sorry that went the wrong way. Now we go back up to our toolbar and we have to click this button to actually start saving data. This is a very important point. You will not save any spectral data until you click this button. 
So make sure that you're following the steps in terms of configuring the saving, and then to actually start saving, you click this button. Okay, so these parameters are really only need to be set once, and then you can subsequent saves can be done clicking this button or even the space bar. Creating a strip chart is something that um, I do frequently when I want to look at a change in something over time just by looking at a wavelength as opposed to the entire spectrum. So um, this one is going to be again in our graph view window, all those wonderful tools. This is how we start a trip chart, strip chart. When I click on this button, it's going to open a strip chart wizard, which is going to walk me through choosing the source of the data, the update rate, picking the wavelengths, what do I actually want my strip chart to do, and then once you've set those parameters, the wizard finishes, and now you've got your strip chart going, where in this case we're looking at intensity over time. So this is just looking at a single wavelength at 500 nanometers over time. So very nice feature in terms of an allowing you to, to look at a, a smaller subset of the data. Finding peaks, again, this is important for people who want to get some peak metrics on what they're looking at. So this is a control again in our graph view. And we're going to click on this button, which is going to start up a small wizard, which is going to walk us through the various steps. Again, choosing the source of the data that we want to find peaks on. If we want a baseline, we can set that. There's some peak finding matrix uh, metrics in terms of saving data and things of that nature. And then how we want to display it. Do we want to show a table of the data? What parameters do we want to output? And so once that wizard is run, then we get this nice window that shows, in, in this case, based on the op options selected, we can see the data that I was interested in plotted above the peaks. We, I've got my table up here that's showing the information I requested. And this panel, very important on the left side of the graph view, is actually going to be used if you want to adjust the parameters you use for your peak finding or if you're done peak finding and just want to make that go away. So you'll see your graph view will change. Uh, it'll have this new panel that'll show up once you're doing your finding peaks. So last but not least is save and reload projects. So we've done all this great work to get the software exactly how we want it, doing exactly the processing that we want to do. Well, there must be a way to save it so that we don't have to go through that every time we run the software. So saving the project is very straightforward. We're here up again in the main window up on the top menu bar. We're going to click this floppy disk looking uh, icon to enable us to save the project. So you click that, it brings up a dialog box, you give your project a name, and you're done. When you're then ready to load that project, there are two options. When you first start the software, the welcome screen will give you the option to load a save project. Or you can go to back up to this toolbar in our main window and you can click the open project icon to get that project opened up for you. So all the work you've done, you can very easily reload it. And one small tip, if you're running absorbance measurements every single day and you don't want to have to run the absorbance wizard, save a project. Run the absorbance wizard once, save a project, call it absorbance. And then every time you start the software, you can reload that project and make whatever changes you need to make to your integration, I mean, your acquisition parameters, and save a new darken reference. So the wizard does not have to be run every time if you save a project to do that processing. So nobody has time to, to redo all of this customization and things, and this is why this is a very valuable feature that we find in the software. So with that, um, what's next? So I would like to uh, thank Givet for such an insightful uh, presentation. Now, instead of having the rest of the part tomorrow, we'll have the, the session by Derek also now with us. So I'll just uh, add him also in the stream.
second. Yeah, uh, we can hear you, yes. Excellent. Well, great advanced analysis to, to pull apart things that are otherwise unseen and or unseeable in spectral data. So uh, we're going to talk about what Ocean View can do today uh, in the schematic. We're going to kind of fly through the wizard aspect and really the main part of the presentation will be a demo where we're going to, going to build from scratch a solution analyzer, a, a nickel chloride uh, plating bath uh, a concentration monitor and you're going to see a couple different ways that you can do that um, using even external files being loaded into uh, ocean view for calibration so it's it's pretty cool so let's start with a recap from uh yesterday so hopefully everyone can see my window uh or the presentation screen here so uh yesterday we went through or Yvette gave an excellent presentation that talked about window management, how you can set up views exactly how you want them in Ocean View. Went through acquisition controls, all the key parameters you have to set up. So you have good uh, measurement uh, parameters there, including averaging box car and integration time. So you're not saturating data logging options a lot of options in there so you can send data where you want it and how you want it at the intervals or thresholds that are meaningful to you strip charting for time resolved studies and i'm going to minimize this here for you guys and also re-referencing so that your uh your values that you're getting are as valid as possible and as meaningful as possible so these are all very critical tools and they give you uh, what you need to do all the standard tasks that you would expect to do uh, in a spectroscopy laboratory and, and to do those, those types of uh, analysis. But what about deeper analysis and complex processing? If you wanna really add a, a level of complexity to your measurements or to your analysis and automate that within the software, that's what OceanView can do. And we're gonna talk about that uh, starting by looking at the wizard. So the wizard is what pops up when you uh, click on the, the ocean view icon in the upper left corner of the software and you get this menu of nine items that pops up right in front of you. And ever since we did the rebranding from ocean optics to ocean insight, I've reflected a lot on what that means and, and, the, and the name and two, three things that that jump out that we offer as Ocean Insight today are our hardware, our techniques and our insight. And the hardware is exactly that. It's the modular hardware that everyone knows and loves for the last 25 years. From, uh, from the Ocean brand. Uh, the, the, in, the techniques are exactly what you see here, which are the nine things that uh, Ocean View presents to you. So you can use all these different spectral techniques, whether it be Raman or absolute irradiance. And then the insight is what we're bringing to you with this webinar, which is our years of expertise and, uh, and that, that ability to uh, apply the techniques in a very uh, significant way. So th this is what you're presented with, and we're going to run through these kind of quickly because, again, we're kind of building up to the demo portion. So this won't be, you know, a, a lesson on Beer's Law or all the individual uh, theories behind these, but we're just going to talk through what it'll uh, put you through in the wizard. So to start off, we're going to talk about the, what we call the art functions or absorbance, reflectance and transmission. Uh, that's definitely going to be the most popular and the most common techniques used uh, in spectroscopy uh, in any laboratory. I mean, this is your high school chemistry, you know, when you're doing the uh, Beer's Law check and, and all that and learning about that. So these are very popular techniques. They're so popular, we actually made devoted freeware for it. And you can go on our website right now, OceanInsight.com, and download for free software called Ocean Art. You can guess what the art stands for. And this allows you to do those three basic processing modes uh, and that's it. 
Uh, and it still lets you do data logging and some basic graph manipulation and, and basic tasks. But if you aren't looking for a whole lot of deep processing and you don't need uh, the absolute irradiance and color tools and all those things, ocean art may be great for you. So that's just something to keep in mind. So when you run through these in the wizard, they all start you with an acquisition setup. So you have to uh, set up exactly what Yvette showed you yesterday, which was setting your averaging uh, to be, uh, I guess, the, the proper level for the, the application at hand. The boxcar width, of course, making sure that you have smoothing that is uh, enough to where you're getting a nice smooth spectrum, but you're not losing resolution for, let's say, really uh, sharp peak activities that you might uh, drown out with too high a boxcar. Uh, and, uh, and likewise with your integration time, so you're not saturating the detector there. And then it's going to ask you for a light reference. So it needs some sort of reference value. And for all three of these are, are processed against some sort of reference condition. So we like to set that up in the most illuminated condition. So let's say if you're having a set of samples um, and that are a, a reflection standard, let's say you want a reflection standard that is going to give you the most light back to your detector. And then the flip of that is the dark reference, which is going to take a snapshot in the dark condition. Uh, and that may not be perfectly dark. You may want to take a dark with the lights on if you're going to be doing the measurements with your room lights on, meaning not not the uh, not the um, light source lights, but let's say the uh, the ambient lights. The dark is meant to to knock out any sort of unwanted uh, signal that isn't coming from your light source or the the main optical chain. So it runs you through these three acquisitions. So what does it do with these values then once it gets light and dark references? So for absorbance, this is the, the equation for absorbance. So it's looking at the ratio of the, the reference intensity versus the live feed intensity, uh, dark corrected, put through a, a log term. So you can see that I not here, if you can see my mouse cursor, this is going to be your light reference that you took. This I dark is going to be your dark reference that you took. The um, I here is just your live spectrometer intensity. And these are all across uh, all the wavelengths for the spectrometer. So this is a broadband acquisition. And then that's put through a log term and that's your absorbance. Now transmission is looking at that same basic ratio, uh, but it has this term on the bottom here. So this is essentially just a percentage. So it's percent transmission of the dark corrected live feed over the uh, the reference uh, the dark corrected reference feed multiplied by 100 and the reflectance measurements the exact same thing as the transmission but what does this tell you then about your sample again without going into a bunch of uh, uh, theory of, of what Beer's law is and all that we know that absorbance is telling us concentration through that Beer's law of relationship where we should have a more or less linear a trend following uh, the absorbance that we see uh, as a function of the concentration of solution. So this is actually looking at some pH, uh, a pH dive, Roman crystal green, at some different uh, alkalinity or acidity levels, I should say. Uh, and we're looking at that change as a function of, the, of changing a concentration. For transmission, it's showing you how much light gets through. So this is uh, some medical tubing that we were testing to see how much UV light was getting through uh, one of the standards and one of the darker pieces uh, through a transmissive setup. And then reflection tells you how much light is bouncing back. So this is actually a, a sample of raw ore, some mineral ore that went into a steel manufacturing process. It actually got melted into the steel uh, stock. And uh, this is, you can see the purple dot right there. That's a UV reflection measurement um, off that to determine the composition uh, of that uh, mineral, which is a very interesting project actually to do. We did a whole UV vis near analysis on a bunch of rocks uh, for that. So you can learn a whole lot uh, from just those techniques. Now, how about Raman and fluorescence? 
I say here that they're so different yet so similar. So they are very different from a physics perspective, what's happening at the quantum level. I don't want to say that they're the same because they aren't. Um, but from a broader logistical handling uh, perspective, they are very similar. And you're going to see why. Uh, they're both going to take you through the acquisition setup the exact same uh, way where you're going to set up the spectrometer uh, in the best mode possible for that application. But they're not going to take a light reference because these aren't working off of a, a, a rate ratio to some reference spectrum. They're really just looking at an emission. So why I say they're very similar is the sense that you're in each case you are pumping in some excitation energy, the photons, and then you're looking at some other emission at other wavelengths, at other uh, energy levels there. And for Raman, it's going to be a laser, so you're going to have a very tight uh, wavelength of photons being pumped in, and you're looking for that Raman shift at, at higher wave numbers as a result. Fluorescence might use a laser, but more commonly uses an LED, or you could use a, a filtered broadband source. That's not terribly uncommon uh, either by any means. So in that sense, they're still handling uh, the the light in the same way. And they do need a dark reference for that same reason that we took one before with the art measurements in that we want to knock out any influence from uh, background uh, ambient lighting or other fluorophores, things like that that might be uh, jumping into the spectrum that we don't want. Now the Raman wizard gives you one extra step and that's setting the laser wavelength. And the reason you do that is because the Raman uh, x-axis is going to be presented in wave numbers or inverse centimeters. But this is a different, I just want to make a comment here that uh, the wave numbers for Raman are different than wave numbers you see when dealing with uh, uh, infrared or, or mid-IR spectroscopy, because those are wave numbers that are inherent to the wavelength of energy uh, whereas a, a Raman wave number is uh, a function of that laser wavelength. So here we're setting it 785. So 785 nanometers is going to be called zero uh, wave numbers, and everything's going to go up from there. If we were doing this at 532 or 1064, it would call that, that wavelength zero wave numbers, and everything would build from there there. So just wanted to make a, a, a distinction between those because that can be confusing uh, for folks. Uh, we sell oxygen sensors as well and the same thing comes up with the PPM and PPB units where folks working in uh, environmental water analysis are talking about PPM. It's very different than folks talking about PPM and in industrial gases. Uh, so same thing here with uh, uh, wave numbers. is It's a little different for Raman. The clean peaks option, if you clicked on, on this option down here for clean peaks, what that's going to do is snap everything that it doesn't determine as a peak to the baseline. So you get a very nice uh, clean view of peaks that are statistically significant. Uh, I think it's a three sigma uh, threshold over the, um, the standard deviation of the, of the baseline region. So everything above that is going to be registered as a peak. So you get very nice clean outputs of that. So let's look at the calculations. Likewise for these, very simple, way easier than the absorbance or the other stuff. It's just the intensity uh, minus the uh, dark intensity. So your live intensity minus dark. And this is why I said they're so similar. The fluorescence is doing the exact same uh, calculation there. And what is that telling us about our sample? With Raman, you're going to get uh, a lot of sharp fingerprint peaks uh, that are uh, emissions inherent to that sample. So you can see here we get very sharp lines that are specific to that analyte. And that can be done at the bulk level, and it can be even down, be done down to the trace level. Now, if you were to need to detect something at the part per billion level, sometimes part per trillion level, you can use our the Ocean Insight surface-enhanced Raman substrates here that you can see on the left. 
this uses a, uh, a an op there's two options there. It uses colloidal gold and or silver uh, in a proprietary matrix, and this will notably enhance this Raman signal. We're talking many orders of magnitude, up to a million times enhancement uh, of these peaks. So if you need to detect things that are kind of trickier, uh, like explosives or pesticides, you can use these substrates to really pump up that uh, that signal to, for trace level analysis for both uh, qualification and quantification. Now, fluorescence is a little different. You're going to get broader emissions usually out, out of fluorescence. So again, nothing's 100% of the time, but usually they're, they're broader. Um, folks working in uh, life sciences will know that uh, a lot of that, those life science um, uh, proteins and DNA, they're, they're going to overlap each other a, a good bit uh, there. And um, in, in that sense, you may not be able to differentiate. But if you know what's in your system and you're confident there isn't stuff from the outside world walking itself in to there, it can still be a very meaningful measurement. As we see here, we're looking at uh, different concentration levels of a, uh, this was a, a polymer, actually a monomer uh, in a process and looking at the fluorescence as a function of concentration and it's very nice uh, uh, change there. This is actually this gift that you're seeing in the upper right is actually phosphorescence, which is similar to fluorescence, but we'll call it the, uh, the F orbital cousin of, um, of fluorescence, a little slower and uh, it's using our 365 nanometer LED. There's a little mound right there. So as we bring the UV light into there, there it glows uh, green. That's the same stuff they put in the glow in the dark uh, stuff, like the, the bouncy balls and things. So before we get into the irradiance and photometry, I I should preface and say I'm not an expert uh, in this by any means. I, I've spent most of my years working with everything we've talked about so far, the absorbance, ROM, and all that stuff. But uh, this is really something that's uh, pertinent to folks that work with uh, lighting characterization or environmental characterization or uh, uh, figuring out metrology around optical components. Um, so these tools still exist in ocean view and that's the main point is to show you that uh while i don't know a lot about it it exists there so if it's meaningful to you it, it's something that you can jump on uh, so if you were to go through an absolute irradiance calibration that's going to call for an irradiance calibration file as you can see that's where you would input that there and it also then gives you the option to specify if you were using an integrating sphere, a known collection area over uh, you know some some square centimeter, or a fiber at some known diameter, like I've put in 450 micron there, or it's going to ask for a lamp file um, when doing this absolute irradiance uh, setup. Now the photometry and energy uh, wizard is literally going to take you through that same process as absolute irradiance. But the relative irradiance is going to ask you for a uh, light source color temperature, um, which uh, is uh, either something you know from your own source or you have a table such as here uh, from Ocean Insight products that list this, for example, the HL2000s 2500 Kelvin there. And all these still begin with an acquisition setup, just as all of them. That's the main point here is to show you that you're always going to be setting up the spectrometer as the first step uh, in the wizard, no matter what you pick, essentially. And you're not going to be putting in a light reference with the uh, irradiance calibration file if that's used, because that's assumed um, to be there. And you can't really see down here, but all this is, says is light reference and dark reference. Um, but uh, you are going to be using a dark reference for all of these so that, again, to knock out anything unwanted from the uh, ambient conditions. So color is really the last, uh, so the last option or selection in that wizard uh, interface. And this is another huge world that I don't know, I will admit, don't know a whole lot about, but when you dive into, and you see some of these slides and snapshots I took, 
and you dive into this yourself, you will quickly find that it's it's almost intimidating how much is in there uh, and how much can be done for different folks working in different uh, worlds of, of application. So when you're going through that wizard, you're going to notice, like I said, a whole range of both inputs and outputs available. So for the inputs, you can see you can work in uh, percent reflection, you can work in your relative irradiance, you can work in absolute irradiance, or you can work in some existing mode that you've already got going and jamming in the software. The guy had a relative irradiance uh, down here already going. But look at the outputs. You can do all of this in a chromaticity diagram and then table outputs as well. You can set the observer to a, a two degree or a 10 degree uh, vantage point there. The illuminant is set. I picked the, um, the D55, which I assume is some daylight uh, iteration. There's a whole big drop down list of illuminant options in there. So this is a very well developed interface for color measurements that again, I'm not the expert in. Uh, but is is there if that is something that you work with a lot. And one thing I want to mention that we make, this is a little bit of a, a self-advertisement here for uh, Ocean Insight product, is the, uh, the WaveGo portable spectrometer. So this is from a business unit that's part of Ocean Insight called the Wave Illumination Group. And this is a, uh, you can see this device in the upper right corner. This is really cool. This is a, a little miniature uh, device with a our, one of our high performance miniature spectrometers inside and a cosine corrector. And this won the Red Dot Design Award in uh, 2019, last year. And it's very powerful in doing these types of color measurements in uh, ambient environmental conditions. So you can use ocean view with this device so you can plug this into your computer and use all the ocean view color measurements with this device or you can use ios and android apps so you can see there some snapshots of the uh, applications that run right on your phone for that now folks are going to use this for a number of things one of the applications is uh, ambient lighting as i said for let's say a high-end a store, let's say a Louis Vuitton store or Target is a good example. Target actually puts a lot of money into making sure that that psychologically you know that you're in a Target from the lighting, from the smell, from everything that how it's laid out. They want you to kind of fall into that Target pocket when you're walking into that store. And this is a good way to quantify what that that ambient environment feels like to a person and then replicate it at other stores or in the world of horticulture and agriculture if you're growing plants that need a very specific let's say a regime of different light energies across their life cycle this is a way to characterize that and, and you can uh, make some really cool measurements and set up some really cool automated processes with that so with and then here's one of the outputs too before we get into the next thing. So this is what Ocean View looks like uh, when you run all of that color uh, wizard through. So you get the chromaticity diagram and you get all these different table values there. So this is what we were building to. Um, and I know we're supposed to stop at uh, 2.30, but we're gonna go a little longer because this is a, a cool demo that we're building up to here. So what did all this do to the schematic window? If we ran through the absorbance wizard and uh, looked at the schematic window after the fact, this is what we'd see. This is what was built by the, the software. And look at our absorbance equation. We have exactly that. I naught minus I dark is this. That's our reference intensity minus, there's the minus block, the background intensity. And then I minus I dark is this subtraction right there. Actually, let's go back there, where it's the live feed minus your background divided by one another, put through a log term. Now to flip it, so it's in this actual orientation, this K block, this constant block is actually a negative one. So that's multiplied. And then we do 
do a absorbance unit labels on there, and then a graph view. Um, all right, here we go. So I'm going to share. Share my screen again. And then. Hopefully my camera's on too. I'm not sure if anyone can see me. Um, but uh, let's see. But if you can uh, see me at all, there is uh, this device, uh, which is one of our flame yes, chem systems. Ignore the uh, the ocean optics logo. It's just what we have from our working from home scenario. And what we're going to do is is build a. Uh, I think I have that. Yeah, that's on. So what we're going to do is build a, a basic absorbance measurement system uh, that gives us the concentration of. And again, I'm not sure if you can see this since my camera is on, but these solutions, which are nickel chloride solutions, so. Let's say that we're uh, the application here is a nickel plating bath. So we're doing uh, electroplating of nickel onto different materials, and and we want to have a nickel plating bath that's achieving 40 grams per liter of nickel chloride in solution. So, so we're going to go ahead and and I've got all these uh, made up some different cuvettes of of solutions, and we're going to put them into this uh, simple device. Now this has the spectrometer, the light source, and then the cuvette holder. So these just pop right in, just like so. And so if we go ahead and turn on, let's set up an absorbance measurement. Let watch how fast this goes. So we're going to turn the lamp on. So let's put in our water reference. I'm going to pop in a water. And let's bring this to 40. Stu scans average maybe five and boxcar I like 10. That's a nice round number. And look at that. We got a nice smooth spectrum there and that's our light source. So now let's go through an absorbance setup. We click on our uh, wizard icon, go to the absorbance. Now you have some options here. These will kind of uh, give you a little cleaner um, labeling out outputs and so on, but we're going to do it ourselves. So I want to show you that. Just like I said, we're going to start with the acquisition parameters. <clears throat> we're going to take our light reference. Took that snapshot. We're going to take our dark reference. So let's turn off the light source. There it goes. We take our dark right there. All right. And then we're going to, and we turn that back on. We're going to finish. And now we're in absorbance view. Now let's throw in one of our 80 gram per liter samples, which is right here. Look at that. Very nice. So just to comment on the graph here. Now let's let's adjust this view. Let's bring peg this to zero. There we go. That looks nice. So obviously we're getting a whole lot of activity, absorbance activity activity here at 400 and then uh, kind of double hump here at uh, what will that look like 650 and about 725 720 or so and note that we don't have any more light anymore here because it's all been absorbed for the most part down in the uh, in the UV region so the first thing to note is that uh, there is a nice baseline region right at 500 nanometers so what we can do here is peg that to zero because we don't want that to jump around. Notice if I can, I'm going to kind of move the cuvette around a little bit. Well, I can't really see it too much. Oh, there you go. Yeah, see how I can like by moving the cuvette kind of move that around a bit. We don't want that to happen. So let's go ahead and take a sub range and peg that to zero. Like we talked about, this is the equation that was built by the uh, wizard. So we're going to go ahead and go to basic math. And I'm going to actually turn this off for a second. So we're going to go to, uh, I'm sorry, advanced math, array math, and do a sub range. 
because this is this multiplier block is the final absorbance output. All this is doing then is going into a unit labels node and then our graph output, which is right there. <coughs> Pardon me. So we're going to do a sub range of about 500 to 503 nanometers. We hit apply. Look at that. So now we can see <coughs> that's our uh, kind of it's noisy, but that's an array value. If we were to make this the same value, note that it makes it a scalar, a single unit. Um, now that's important for the next thing we're going to do because the you can do mathematical processes on a scalar single value, but on a an array of values like this, you're going to have to reduce that down to a, a single value and you can do that with an average block. So check this out. We're going to go ahead and connect that to an average block. And now this is the average of that 500 to 503 range. And this is what we want to subtract out from everything else, right? So let's go ahead and do basic math and subtract. And we're going to do our main feed minus that. And that's our new baseline corrected view. So let's get rid of this. If I can do that. And let's connect it to here. Bam. And notice that now this is pegged <coughs> to 500 uh, nanometers. And it'll always stay there. So we can kind of clean up our, our view a little bit. There we go. Now, I had done before this um, some, so we can either use the 400 nanometer or something out here to do this uh, concentration uh, analysis. I had done this in Excel, so hopefully you can see this. Um, and this is showing uh, the different concentration levels, 30, 40, 60, and 80 grams per liter. And we get really nice growth here, just as, like textbook quality. And then we get this uh, classic plot showing absorbance versus concentration. And we get a really nice 0.9997 R squared linear fit. Perfect, right? Right out of a textbook. But this isn't what we really want. Um, this is great for your high school chemistry homework to do absorbance versus concentration but we want the opposite of this we want concentration versus absorbance because our input our x value is going to be this and our output we want to be concentration and that's our y so we know that 114.7 times the absorbance at 723 that was the correlation i had used right there that's going to give us a really nice uh, nickel concentration value. So let's go ahead and build that in. So if we go ahead and take another sub range. So we're going to go to advanced math, array math, sub range, and we're going to do 723. So we're going to pull off of our baseline corrected feed. Let's just do 723 to 723. And that's our value right there, which is you can see is 0.69 and then about 0.7 right there. So that's what we're looking for. Now we want to have a, our constant blocks. So let's do a constant. We said 114.7, if I'm if I recall, 114.7. And let's multiply those together. And zip those together. Let's add a, a label block. Now check this out. You can right click and also duplicate things that already exist. So I'm just going to duplicate that same unit block. Bring that over there. And then one of our view options, you have graph, scalar, table, or a color view. We want a scalar value. So let's bring that and look at that. Now let's change these units because we don't we don't want that. We want that to say NiCl2 concentration and our the label there is grams per liter. Now that's great except the units are, I mean, look at all those decimals. That looks pretty messy, right? 
So let's go in and clean that up. Let's go to unit precision, dial that down to maybe two. That looks a little better. All right, now there we go. Now we have a nickel chloride concentration monitor. Let's take some of our other, um, let's take some of our other uh, solutions here. So let's pop in uh, one of our 30. So here's a 30, throw that in. Look at that, 29.6, looks pretty good. Let's throw in one of our 40s. 39.98, 40 right there. Let's throw in one of our 60s. There's a 60. And there's 60. So now we're very quickly getting an answer about these solutions uh, that is very you know, important for this nickel plating process so we can quickly you know adjust the dilutions now real quick let's say that uh this is a a a good way if you've already done the analysis and you know what this coefficient is to put this in but let's say that you're have a huge you've got like a huge calibration regression and it's updated very regularly you don't want to uh deal with um you know putting in just a constant value like this so let's get rid of this. We're going to feed in we're going to feed in a an external file. So check this out. This is a file uh, with those same values that I created. So this is only 5 points, but this could be 500 points if you had a a big uh, a calibration list, let's say of data. And we're going to feed this in using what's called the linear regression tool and the function evaluator. So one of our sources options is going to be, so we can do a data source. The black body simulator is really cool. We won't have time for that, but, but if you get a chance, play with that. Uh, and then the, what we're gonna bring in is, is the file. So now let's go to advanced math, array math, and linear regression. Let's bring in that file we had mentioned. Hopefully it, uh, yeah, OV webinar. So that was our nickel cow and see that was that line that that the data set had had characterized or drawn there so that was the, the values from that file we're going to bring it into a linear regression and we're also going to bring in a an array map here a function evaluator evaluate function we're going to bring that in and before we connect these i want to show you what this is going to do. So in the linear regression, you can set the order of this. First order is just linear, right? Or you can bring it up to nine, actually, nine order polynomial. So let's say we're fourth order. It's going to give do that fit and give you coefficients for all those. Or if you don't pay the uh, intercept to zero, it'll also give you a non-zero value for this first coefficient. But we want that. We want this to be down to one. And notice that we're back at 114.7, just like we had with our K block, right? So now if we plug this into here and this into here, let's see if we pop in our 60 again. Ta-da, there we go. So now think about what we've done here with this. We have successfully created a nickel chloride concentration monitor that has active baseline uh, correction built into it. So if there's any shifts in the optics or so on, it corrects for that. And the ability to load in an external calibration file here from a source that you may be updating with some other protocol in your process or whatnot. So you can build these very quickly. And we did this in like 15 minutes. This would have been, you know, a, a bunch of money probably from a, a custom engineering firm if you had presented the same thing but we want to give you the tools to do this this stuff very easily yourself now that is to say these are ideal solutions right these are very clean perfect uh nickel chloride and, and di water now in a real world scenario there's going to be other stuff in there things that sediment that causes turbidity maybe other fluorophores and so in that case that maybe you can't work it out yourself or I'm sure you could you're all very smart people but 
uh, if, if you don't have the time, let's say, to work it out yourself, Ocean Insight also offers very advanced uh, it, machine learning, spectral machine learning, uh, what we call ocean intelligence, which is a pl platform that can deconvolute extremely complex mixtures, more than what you can even imagine. I mean, some of the demos get get crazy how, how good they are. So that's something to talk to us about if you uh, want to deconvolute or, or understand more about deeper complex uh, mixtures uh, of things. So. That's basically what we wanted to run through, but look at everything you can do in here. You have all your different bound options, uh, your time series, sources, as we said, um, filtering, all different types of filtering options. So there is a lot in here that you can build uh, and make massive schematics that automate. And then you can go in here, just like Yvette said yesterday, go in and save this as a project and it will load all this right back up. So now you have that tool built and ready to go. That was a very extensive, elaborate, and a very insightful session by uh, Derek Gunther. So let's move on to the question and answer session. And before moving to that, uh, we have shared a feedback form. Kindly fill in that. And if you want a certificate for the webinar, uh, kindly mention that in the feedback, feedback form. Uh, now quickly, I will move on to the question and answer session. So I would like to invite uh, Wilson Joseph from our uh, engineering department. Oh uh, yeah, so let's just add him in the stream and answer the question. Hi, everyone. Hi. Is it possible to draw a 3D structure as per our convenience? I think uh, this question is related to some 3D CAD software uh, called CreoWeave, and it's being confused with uh ocean weave software i'm not right i'm sorry we cannot do any 3d weave here yeah sure so a uh, time series can be uh I'm using this deep trendline time wave. Okay. So you just have to select the source spectrometer. As of now, I have not connected any spectrometers, so it's the simulation. And uh, I can select the spectrometer and uh, say update after every scan and uh, just select circular and uh, at what wavelength you want to see maybe at uh, 400 or 500 or whatever wavelength uh, you are interested you just say finish uh, you'll get the wave of trend line uh, the intensity at that particular wavelength versus time So that's clear. Uh, difference between IO and I, uh, it's probably the intensity at time zero and uh, the final intensity for some calculations. So uh, if you are doing a baseline probably uh, and doing a calculation, so for that reason, I minus I O is going to give you the difference between you the final the incident light and the emitted light, right? Yes. 
yeah ios incident and an ios benefit like so i think these were the these were the questions we don't have any more questions so i would just yeah thank all the our audience for being such good audience and then yeah it was a very interactive and nice session so if you want more such videos you can just like share and comment and subscribe to our channel and then if you have any suggestion suggestions about our future videos then uh, kindly comment that below as well and also if you have any uh, requirement of spectrometers optical fibers or any accessories related to this you can uh, come to our website and then you can uh, you can contact you can click the contact me and let us know what is the requirement you have and then we'll address that thank you so much again for being such a good audience yeah i would like to end up, end up the session thank you bye have a nice day thank you yeah thank you wilson